Shall we start? Everybody ready? Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, very special session. Uh, as the program uh, promised you, we're going to have a unique glimpse into how successful, powerful women uh, manage to cross barriers. My name is Milet Shamir. I'm a professor here at Tel Aviv University uh, in the Faculty of Humanities. And I've also, for the past uh, two years, have been the Vice President for International Collaborations. And I always tell my friends that I have the best job on campus. And part of why that is true is because I really get to meet some fascinating people from all around the world. And today uh, is no exception. I'm delighted and honored to be sharing the stage today with three remarkable women. Uh, each one uh, has achievements that are uh, world-changing, and I don't use that word uh, lightly. Uh, literally, each one of these women has changed the world and is changing the world in ways that I'm sure we'll get uh, to talk about. What brings them all together uh, to Tel Aviv is that uh, tomorrow night, they each will be receiving an honorary doctorate from Tel Aviv University, and we're very <laughs> proud about that. Um, and I'm going to begin by uh, introducing uh, each one, starting from the far left, uh, Professor Katalin Carrico, uh, who is Senior Vice President uh, of the biomedical company BioNTech, uh, where she started to work, I think, in 2013. She's also a professor at the University of Szeged um, and in Hungary, uh, as well as an affiliated professor of the University of Pennsylvania. And for, I think, four decades now, Professor Carrico's research has been focusing on RNA-mediated mechanisms for protein therapy, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about has many, many different important uses, but has recently come under the spotlight because uh, Professor Carrico's uh, discoveries and her patents, uh, together with her uh, partner, uh, has created uh, the technology that allowed us to have the COVID-19 uh, RNA, mRNA vaccinations of uh, BioNTech, Pfizer, as well as uh, Moderna. Um, <laughs> and for her uh, multiple achievements, uh, Professor Carrico has received uh, numerous prestigious awards, including the Japan Prize, the Breakthrough Prize, and the Lasker uh, Award. And it's really great to have you here, Kati. Thank you. And moving to my immediate left, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Jody Cantor, who is an investigative journalist working with the New York Times, uh, a best-selling author, um, whose uh, who's reporting over the years have covered a very wide range of uh, issues, um, exposed hidden truths, about power, about gender, about technology, about politics, about culture, and about the relationship between all these different uh, fields. Uh, in the course of her career, Jody has reported on anything from the Obamas and their entrance to the White House, through breastfeeding uh, class disparities, uh, through Amazon and Starbucks uh, treatment of their employees, women in, uh, in uh, Wall Street, in, uh, in elite business schools, uh, and much, much more. Uh, in October 2017, as many of you I'm sure know, um, Jody and her uh, partner, Megan Tui, broke the story of Harvey Weinstein uh, in his decades of, uh, of sexual abuse. Uh, their work uh, helped to ignite the Me Too movement and created new attitudes, laws, policies, standards of behavior and accountability um, around the globe, not just in America, but everywhere, including here in Israel. And for this work, they were awarded uh, the Pulitzer Pro Prize for Public Service, uh, journalism's uh, highest award. So very happy to have you here, Jody. <laughs> and on my right, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Corey Bergman, who is a neurobiologist and geneticist. Uh, she's the Torsen N. Weasel, I don't know if it's Weasel or Weasel, uh, what the pronunciation is, uh, at the Rockefeller University. And her groundbreaking uh, research uh, that mostly deals with the relationship between genes, motivational states, and behavior 
has been recognized uh, in numerous ways, including a membership in the National Academy of Sciences, uh, the Breakthrough Prize uh, uh, in, uh, in Life Sciences, uh, and more and more uh, prizes uh, as well. Corey served as the co-chair of the NIH working group that planned the Brain Initiative. Uh, she was uh, an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for, I think, two decades, uh, if, that, if that's right. And since 2016, uh, she's been serving as the head of science at the uh, Chan uh, Zuckerberg Initiative. Uh, as some of you may know, the goal of this initiative is nothing less than to help cure, manage, or prevent all disease by the year 2100. And Professor Bargman presides over the research projects that are meant to uh, help meet this, uh, this lofty goal. Uh, so thank you, uh, Corey, for your work and for being here today. So um, let me begin by asking you this. I've just recounted some of your uh, recent achievements and prizes and awards, but I want to start by going back uh, in time. Uh, I'm a little curious about how, uh, what is the early path that has brought you to where you are uh, today? Especially since all three of you uh, decided uh, to choose fields that traditionally, certainly in the years in which you grew up, were male bastions, right? Whether it's the smoke-filled rooms of investigative journalism or the labs of elite uh, scientific uh, institutions. Uh, so I would like to ask you a little bit about uh, your early years, and maybe I'll start with you, Corey. Um, I know that you grew up uh, in uh, Athens, Georgia, in a family of four girls, if I'm not mistaken, a little like little women. Um, and I'm, I would love to ask you a little bit how uh, you decided that you wanted to become a scientist. What were some of your early inspirations? Uh, how did you find yourself on this path to uh, serious scientific work? So, first of all, should I turn this down? Should I use this? Yes. yes. Right. So, first of all, I grew up in an academic household. My father was a professor of statistics and computer science. There's still a laboratory at the University of Georgia computer lab named after him, the Bargman Lab. And my parents valued education above all things, and I think that's typical for immigrants. And in this sort of a setting, our job as children was to learn everything and to really achieve at a high level. And that, I, I can remember sitting at the dinner table and if we were gonna clink glasses with champagne, we had to first calculate how many times the glasses were going to clink as we went around <laughs> the table. And so there was this sort of constant sense of sort of questioning and discovery and learning. A little intimidating, it must have been. It, it, well, no, because that was how the family was. We were all, f and you know, now they're all frighteningly well-educated. My father was a professor, my sister is a professor, my other sister is a professor, my brother-in-law is a professor, my husband is a professor. <laughs> no one in my family has had a real job in generations. <laughs> and, so the, this sort of like love of learning is something that really comes straight from the home for us. And the particular path to science, I think, came partly because growing up in the 1960s, during the space age, there was such excitement and enthusiasm about science, and everyone wanted to be an astronaut, and this was something that sort of was around. And just to sort of comment maybe a little bit on the question that you started with, um, the, you know, the, the thing about my family was that my father always made us believe that we could do anything. And my sisters were very successful. My oldest sister was the valedictorian in college, and therefore I could be too. And so having those examples of someone who is successful, having that support system of people who believe in you is so important. And I think that, was not, that is not true for everyone even today, and it certainly was not then. And yeah, so the path to science itself was sort of learning, curiosity, and then landing in a laboratory at the age of 17 and realizing there was nothing I wanted to do more than to discover new things in the company of smart people. And that has been my path ever since, is to remain in this kind of world where you can make new discoveries, where you can talk to other people who are, have di ideas different from your own and then make those discoveries even greater. Um, but That's great. I'm going to ask you a little bit about uh, the particular science that interested you, but uh, before we do that, let me ask you, Jody. Um, again, a question about your, your childhood, your family. 
Um, I happened to see an interview that you did with your grandmother, I think for CBS, uh, that was very moving uh, to me. Uh, really a, a wonderful conversation between a 90 plus year old woman and her granddaughter. And I wanted to ask you, uh, was she a big influence uh, in your life? Uh, is she one of the people that you uh, look to uh, for inspiration, for having the strength to go in the path that you've gone down? Um, well, first of all, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. First of all, I'm so delighted to be here, so honored by this honor, so glad to be in all of your company. And I feel especially happy to be on stage with two scientists, even though I never made it beyond college science, because I think what our work does have in common is a spirit of open-minded inquiry and a sense that we're really just trying to put knowledge on the table, um, it, knowledge that we may, we may not know how that knowledge will be used uh, once other people get their hands on it. But in investigative journalism, um, it really is about uh, unearthing secrets, and it's very important not to have predetermined conclusions, but to come to it in a spirit of complete intellectual honesty and openness to know that you may not find anything at all, that the finding may contradict your initial assumptions. Um, and so even though our work is very different, it, it really feels to me like it's carried out in very much the same spirit. Um, so to answer your question, yes, my grandmother um, is my lodestar. She's a 98-year-old Holocaust survivor. My, my parents, my, my dad, her son is right there. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I was growing up, I, I thought everybody's grandparents were Holocaust survivors. <laughs> I had no idea that there was anything unusual about it. Um, I think there are two kinds of Holocaust survivors. There are those who talk about what happened and those who don't. My grandmother was the opened kind. My, my grandfather, who died when I was in college, was the closed kind. But I think as a child, even though I didn't really know it, I was surrounded by the questions of investigative journalism. You know, what, what kinds of stories are the people all around you carrying? Mm -hmm. You know, I spent a lot of time with, with elderly Holocaust survivors as a child. Um, how could something like this have happened? Who was complicit? How did the system work? Was it even illegal or did the law in fact support the wrongdoing? These are the classic questions of investigative journalism. And so even though it took me many decades to define myself as an investigative journalist, when I look back to my childhood, I really feel that I was surrounded by the essential questions. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting because Holocaust survivors who don't speak really require a very skilled question uh, uh, maker in order to allow them to open up and tell about their experiences. Exactly, right, even that question of why does one person talk and not the other person and mm -hmm. what is required for someone to open up and is it better if they open up, you know, or like at what point do you have to respect their desire to remain silent? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. And moving on to, uh, to Kati, uh, your uh, early path was a little different because in addition to being uh, a woman who made a career in uh, traditionally male science, you're also an immigrant or were an immigrant uh, and you grew up I think it is a small town in, in Hungary, very remote from the, the centers of uh, you know, big scientific ideas. How did you find yourself on the path to becoming a scientist? So I, I was uh, growing up in a small Hungarian town in the middle of the plain. 10,000 people lived there, and I can tell you that how many things we didn't have in our home, running water and other things, but, but what I have is uh, loving parents, I had a sister, an older sister, so in school they constantly was referring that the little Kariko, I was the tallest always, but the, you know, they called little because my sister was older and she was very good and I had to be good also. So that was what similar Corey mentioned that you had to follow your siblings and you have to go and be good. And um, although my parents had just elementary school education, my father had six and my mother had eight elementary school and but because the war they couldn't go to so they don't had formal education 
but um, my father was very smart, play on violin. He, he could multiply in his head uh, two digit number, two digit number. I work side by him in the uh, uh, butcher's shop because that's what uh, he was, butcher. And uh, so I heard from my parents in early on that I, I was watching when my father was processing the animal and I was curious to see what is inside, whereas my mother and sister were, you know, turning on the radio, they don't want to hear, know about these things. <laughs> I, I don't remember those, but um, as a child we had animals around the house and I was interested, you know, we had chicken and I have seen how it's coming out from the eggs and, and it was everything we, around us was interesting, a uh, lot of plants we have and we see, we had uh, our little garden with my sister and we could see how the plants are coming, so, and I had excellent teachers and uh, according to the book in high school, 16 years old, I announced I will be a scientist. I have never seen one, you know, in our... <laughs> In our family, you know, nobody had uh, even high school diploma, but my teacher was, you know, believing that I can be. And um, thanks to the help, you know, my parents always emphasized that we have to, uh, you know, study is important. So it was. And when we said the homework is ready, then we did a lot of chores, you know. We mm -hmm. cooked, we cleaned, we, you know, work on the field. Mm -hmm but, you know, when the homework was done. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then at the age of uh, 30, I think, uh, with a <laughs> small daughter of two years old uh, and your husband, you decided to move to the States. Uh, the, yep. myth, the myth tells us that you had $900 in your pocket. <laughs> um, so I'm very curious to, to hear yeah. what were these first years like as an immigrant woman with a yeah. small child to try to make it in America in the, the world of science. Yeah, so... Uh, Actually, you said that we, had, we decided, we had to decide because many times in my life I was terminated in a position. And I have to tell you, I would not be here if I, it wouldn't happen. So <laughs> you have to be, you know, just find a good solution and alternative when you have difficulties. And um, so I wanted to, you know, I want to be a scientist and I wanted a challenging job and that's why I tried to get first a job close to home but then have to leave and go to America. I never wanted to go there. Everybody around me in the <laughs> institute wanted, oh, America. I was happy in Hungary. And, but, um, uh, you know, with my husband and my two years old daughter, we were allowed to leave Hungary with $100. I had a job offer. And uh, so it was a lot of money, but, you know, not to survive <laughs> for a family. And so we put the money, the remaining money, which we sold our cars really in, my daughter's teddy bear because we had to hide. It was on, you cannot officially own that money. Oh, wow. And uh, so we arrived and can you imagine there is no credit card, no, no, nobody we would know. And there is a one way ticket. And that's what the immigrants all about in America. They drop in the deep water and you have to learn to swim, swim against the flow. And, <laughs> and then it w that's, that's what makes uh, us different because we had to survive there. We have to succeed. And, yeah. uh, and then we just, I, I work day and night and try to, you know, make it. Yeah, maybe that's an answer to the question of why so <laughs> many successful scientists in America today are from immigrant uh, backgrounds. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, maybe we'll turn a little bit to uh, your work and back to uh, Corey. Corey, I know that you started out actually at MIT as a graduate student in cancer research, right? And then at some point, you made the switch to neuroscience. Um, and I wanted to ask you, you know, what, uh, what questions did you have that you were hoping to find the answers in neuroscience and nowhere else? What's the thing that motivated you intellectually to make that switch to uh, neuroscience? So my problem in answering that question is that I cannot imagine that anyone would not want to understand how the brain works. <laughs> how does my brain work? How does my child's brain work? Uh, these are, how does my mother's brain work? It's just the question we ask ourselves every day. And my path to that actually came from my mother, who, when I was a child in my absurdly overeducated home, read me the works of Conrad Lorenz and Carl von Frisch and the stories of, of the biology of behavior. 
and how there were certain behaviors that were innate to animals and that could be seen in all individuals. And the people who did this work 100 years ago didn't have the right words to describe that, but what that meant was that there was some kind of a genetics of behavior. There's some way that the genome was able to encode responses to the environment and would make it possible for individual animals or to grow up and to be able to respond in the right way the first time they saw something and then shape that behavior with learning and with further experience and with environments. And I was just fascinated by that notion of how genetics could encode something as complicated and conditional and strange as behavior. And in, in that time, that was the idea that, that you could study a genetics of behavior was still a little bit um, questionable, in fact. The first people to do it were people who were studying circadian rhythm in Drosophila, who include my now colleague Michael Young, who's uh, won the Nobel Prize for this work. But it was really kind of a strange idea that you could do this. And so um, I set about to find a system where you could do that by taking a system where the genetics was very, very clear and straightforward, and the behavior was very, very simple and easy to study, and yet rich enough to be interesting. And that was how I came to the worms. The worms. <laughs> so the, an animal who's, who, that learns, that smells, that recognizes its kin, that flees from dangerous conditions, that um, and responds to different environments, and an animal that is transparent, so you can see everything that's happening in it. You can see what's happening in every brain cell while it's thinking and behaving, and where you can understand one gene at a time what each gene is doing when it gives rise to a certain behavior. So a lot of it was just choosing a, a system. I think um, Einstein said you should make this, you should. You should make things as simple as they can be, but no simpler. And so this was a simple, simple system that allowed us to ask questions about genes and cells and brains and behavior that were just not possible anywhere else. And, um, and to the surprise of even those of us who worked on these simple animals, the, the principles and the genes that we discovered turn out to be shared with many other animals, including ourselves. And so my circadian rhythm friends, for example, um, who were studying fruit flies that would fly around or do different things, basically understand how jet lag happens in me the day after I have come here from the United States. It is the same underlying biology. And the same thing was true of, of many of the discoveries that we made in that time. And it was that that allowed us to translate back and forth between very simple principles in simple animals, and just the underlying basis of behavior in more complex animals. So can I uh, push you a little bit to give us an example of something that we share with C. elegans? Sure. So um, one of the things that we learned was that, that behaviors were encoded in the scientific phrases labeled lines that certain important behaviors are from the moment of your birth laid down by, by nerve cells that make connections that go to the brain and that transmit an information not just about what the world is, but what you should do about it. And so, for example, certain um, smells or tastes are innately attractive to a worm or to a baby and innately repulsive to a worm or to a baby. Sweet things are attractive to a baby. Bitter things are repulsive. We know this at birth. And we showed that that happens starting at the very first cell that senses the environment, that it already knows what behavior it will do. And we showed how it senses it, then how it, we did a lot of work to understand how it wires up, how those connections are laid down in development so that you can get the right response the very first time that the stimulus arrives and then gives rise to different behaviors. We played cruel tricks on the animal. We made it um, hate things that it was supposed to love and vice versa. That was enjoyable. Um, <laughs> but I think, so we were able to sort of derive a set of principles and work forward on that. And of course, that does not mean that biology is destiny. Um, anyone who had a cup of coffee outside has learned to suppress their dislike of bitter substances. 
And so, you know, we do change our own behaviors, we make our own decisions. But I think it's worth understanding that there is a biology and underpinning to help us understand how our more complex systems are built up from basic components, basic things that we share with other animals and then elaborate on in our own biology. That's really fascinating, uh, you know, for anyone who's interested and we all are in nature versus nurture. Uh, thank you. Um, and now maybe I'll ask Katya a similar question about your own research. You know, we all, I think, kid ourselves nowadays that we know something about mRNA uh, RNA because we all follow the stories about the vaccination and, uh, uh, of course, we know nothing, especially me, who's, you know, my field is history and literature. Um, so I would very much like to ask you, uh, maybe to explain to us, uh, lay people, uh, in simple terms, what, what was your most important breakthrough scientifically in regards to uh, RNA? So that, that's great because, you know, everybody can learn and people know about PCR, know about messenger RNA. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's what we missed before, that we did not educate the public enough and they didn't know what molecular biology is doing and uh, so they, some get scared about mRNA. But the mRNA and the vaccine is, you know, the mRNA we did not invent it, the nature invented, and this is a molecule when in 60 years ago, the scientists were wonder that if all of the genetic information, and by 1950s we already know, you know that uh, DNA has all of the genetic information and it is in the nucleus, but all of the protein is made in, uh, in the cytoplasm. And they never found in the cytoplasm any DNA. And they were wondering that how the information is getting to there. Because the protein, the different protein is which makes us, is what is important. And then it was coded in the DNA, but something had to be carried on. And, and the two papers which was published 60 years ago both said that it is an unstable intermediate. It took so much time to finally identified because it is quickly, it is just coming from the nuclei, translate and then degrades. And so it is very uh, transient, but it carries a copy from the DNA and somewhat process coming out from the nuclei to the protein making factory, the protein factory, and this reading the order of the nucleotides will decide that what will be the order of amino acid which create different protein which is on the skin, in our hair, or whatever defined. And mm -hmm. so, so this is an element that uh, present in everywhere, even the virus has RNA as we learned, yeah? because for example the COVID-19 also a, a mRNA virus. So it has an RNA, which is big one, and we just use the little piece, and mm -hmm. uh, we make it in a tube. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, when we deliver, it quickly, very quickly degrades, and mm -hmm. we already knew that how deep temperature we had to store it to mm -hmm. make sure that it won't degrade. So this um, RNA is nature invented things, and mm -hmm. code for the critical protein, and it was uh, 1984 when first time scientists made possible that to make in a tube. In, and a desired, any desired uh, uh, protein could be coded by this mRNA. And of course, all of the technology was uh, developed and uh, made it possible that this mRNA can be produced, can be delivered to the cell, and uh, can code for a therapeutic protein which can help healing or stop pain, and, uh, and of course, uh, many other things which you already in these days daily you can hear in the television that now the mRNA is tested out for different things, not just for vaccine, vaccine against viruses, bacteria, and parasite like uh, malaria, and, uh, and many others field. And uh, important is that the mRNA is always from four basic nucleotides, is made, and so just the order is different. So whether you are making a vaccine, RNA, or for therapeutic, it is made the same way. Mm -hmm. Copied out from a piece of DNA which you can order. And uh, it is very cheap. So it makes, uh, you know, the many things, vaccines, which is right now is very expensive, will be affordable. Mm -hmm. Because like uh, for shingles is uh, right now is like 800 euro, the vaccine, and then it will be. Uh, much cheaper for, so it is equalizer. And many protein product actually, which is in the market, which like thousands of dollars, because protein base is 
very expensive. You had to figure out how to purify the protein. The body can make the protein from the mRNA you inject, so everything will be affordable. Mm -hmm. So it will so have that. When, when you made that uh, initial discovery in the, in the test tube, were you able at all to predict what, uh, what some of the consequences of this will be for the world of uh, uh, therapeutic medicine? So, so the discovery, what I did, people started to use in the 90s, you know, the RNA for vaccine against cancer or infectious disease or therapeutic purposes. And if you look at there every year, one paper, and those scientists never published again, because it's very small amount of protein, very short time, and the RNA had one thing, just problem. It was inflammatory also. And then when we discovered with Drew Weissman, with my colleague, that the RNA inflammatory, I was already working 10 years on trying to help it for uh, treatment of stroke. And then I was like devastated that, you know, that's the last thing I would deliver to a stroke patient, an inflammatory molecule. They had already so much inflammation and that made me to start to figure out, can I make it non-inflammatory? Of course, many times scientists start to do something and they don't know whether it is doable or not. And uh, when it was uh, non-inflammatory and it translated so well, I knew that it will be, it will be useful and good for treating uh, uh, disease. And uh, the first one, we used the anemia. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we could uh, show that uh, one single dose to an animal could uh, treat uh, and increase the red blood cell number. And mm -hmm. so I knew, and it will be, even if we don't have the uh, COVID um, um, and this pandemia, I, this would be, or it, and actually it was already treatment for heart failure. In 2008, 2018 was already injected AstraZeneca, Moderna already injected patient who had heart failure and uh, they were already phase two trial. Recently we learned that how well the, this uh, mRNA which helped to generate new blood vessels worked on those patients mm -hmm. and they did much better now. So heart failure, liver disease, it was already uh, used and, and successful. So mm -hmm. it would have been, you know, introduced and for mm -hmm. use many other things, but for the pandemia, you know, it, it was what used. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And um, made more well known. Yeah. Uh, Jody, I take your point that there's a similarity between what you do and what Kati and uh, Corey do, but still it feels like moving into a very different world when I ask you about uh, your own work. Um, and I'd like to ask you maybe uh, to speak uh, in more general terms about your approach to journalism, because one of the things that I've noticed is that even when you're investigating a topic that doesn't have to do directly with gender or with women, you take the angle of gender or you choose a woman protagonist uh, for your story, Michelle Obama rather than uh, Barack Obama. Uh, you know, the, the single mother uh, uh, worker of Starbucks uh, who's struggling uh, to make ends meet. Um, and I came across, as I read She Said, your book, which is, by the way, very wonderful, I, read, uh, I came across something that you said. You said that gender is not just a topic, but a kind of investigative entry point. Uh, and I was wondering if maybe you can explain to us uh, what you mean by that, and what is gender to you uh, as a journalist? Sure. So I think it started out as more of a traditional topic to me. I started, I had always written with an emphasis on women, but I started, I really became an investigative journalist in the wake of having been a political journalist and having covered in particular um, Hillary Clinton's first attempt at the US presidency, which sparked a massive gender debate in the US. Why are these barriers so stubborn? We see it in every field, we see it in science. Um, how come progress with gender feels on the one hand very fast, you know, and then on the other hand, many things feel very stuck, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what I wanted to do, the gender debate around, I don't know, 2010, 2013 in the US, it was filled with feelings. There were a lot of blog posts. There, were, there was a lot of commentary. People had a lot of personal stories and personal accounts. But what I felt it needed was more empirical fact. Um, and you know, my contribution is less like the data that a scientist would produce and more um, the things that society can't see, you know, the kind of secrets. You know, I, I went in with the question, what information could we unearth and put on the table that would help 
the gender debate in this country advance because I think debates get better when we have more information and more accurate information. Um, and so I started, I started reporting on gender, but I did find that gender became a kind of investigative can opener because, first of all, because stories have mostly been told from, you know, kind of the male point of view forever, there, I think, is more discovery and more freshness that you can get um, out of focusing on women. And also because women are often the outsiders in organizations, you can learn a tremendous amount by focusing on them. That was true at Starbucks. I was writing about the scheduling algorithms that were really tearing apart the lives of low-income workers because these, like basically, this computer-driven scheduling was brilliant at synchronizing business needs and creating efficiencies and kind of optimizing labor deployment but it was wrecking havoc in the lives of workers because people would get their schedules a day in advance. They'd be scheduled to work two hours there and three hours there. They'd be sent home if business was low. And what it meant is that if you were, for example, like the subject of my story, Jeanette Navarro, if, if you were a single mom, how could you schedule a doctor's visit for your child or a parent-teacher conference? There was no... Uh, there was no predictability. Um, and so, of course, that was also true of the Weinstein story, because if you really, really, really looked at the story from the women's point of view, it looked very different mm -hmm. from the dominant narrative. Yeah, and we'll get to the Weinstein story uh, uh, very soon, but uh, even before that, uh, I'd like to address a question to Corey and to Kati together. Um, one of the things that we talked about this morning when we had our plenary session uh, is the, the state of uh, women in STEM, uh, which of course is much, much better than it, is, uh, than it was when you started out. But still, at Tel Aviv University, for example, one of the things that we uh, talked about this morning is that there's a kind of a seeping out of women uh, in, say, our exact sciences uh, faculty the more you advance in, in your career, right? So we have about a third of our students are women uh, on the under, undergraduate level, and then for the MA level, it's maybe 15%, and the PhD is even less, and with faculty, it's much, much less. And you know, the faculty here is doing amazing things with mentoring systems, trying to uh, repair that. But the two of you, you know, you have a panoramic view on, on the science world, not only as top scientists, but also as women in position of leadership. Uh, in your case, with the Chan Zuckerberg um, Initiative uh, in, bio in BioNTech, um, you can see the field. And I'm, I'd love to hear from uh, either one of you or both of you what you think are uh, women facing today uh, in science and whether you have any advice for young women scientists who are just starting out from your own experience. So I don't know who would like to start. So just again to say what you said, things are much better than they were. And I really have to, I think, I have to give credit to the women 10 years ahead of me or further who opened the doors that made it possible for people like me to go through. But at the same time, as you say, it's still a process of people going through the system. And I've reflected on what in my own case made it possible to be successful. And I'll tell you first of all, that it was people who believed in me not just women, but men. My PhD advisor, Bob Weinberg, was like my father, a man who believed I could do anything and um, really supported me. And when you are in a minority, it's really important that others reach out. It's the responsibility of everyone to see that that kind of mentorship and acceptance happens. When I came to graduate school, I had never had a woman as a professor in any class in English, in history, in anything. It's, it's easy to forget how recently that could be true at the university. And as I came to graduate school, for the first time I started to see women who were older than I am, who were successful, that I could imagine myself being someone like this. And so the first thing is to have a mentor, to have mentors who believe in you. The second is to have some sort of an example to look at. Mm -hmm. 
And then the third thing is your peers. Your peers are so important. You need a group of people who support you. And again, they can be men or they can be women, but you're growing up together with people facing the same problems. And you need to work together to go through that. Mm -hmm. And you know, as I see over time, I see more and more progress. Um, it's not done, but as it says in the Mishnah, um, you are not required to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. And we have to just keep working on this problem, men and women, as mentors, as students, as peers, and then continue to bring up for equality in this area. I find that uh, truly uh, fascinating because we always assume that if, for example, if you built a mentorship system, it has to be based on women. And I think you're absolutely right. There is no reason why uh, you know, women should not have um, men mentors who understand uh, the perspective of women students and can identify and, and nurture them. Uh, so it's very interesting. Uh, food for thought. Um, Kati, would you like to add anything? Yeah. So what I, I can see is that the uh, one that uh, where uh, some talent, where I could have been lost, one was that the university, so the university can do something. In the uh, University of Seged organized for uh, underprivileged children who were in high school, the thir third year in high school, uh, a program. So when I went to the entry exam, I already have seen a professor. I have already entered the building of a university building mm -hmm. because before that I have never seen a professor. And so in a summer program, in two weeks in a summer, I participated, entered the building, I have seen a professor and I knew that they are look like me and then I don't have to be afraid. <laughs> this was one. The other was, you know, having a child. And in Hungary at that time, it was a affordable, high quality childcare. And that was very important. I could see now that when I went to the United States and how, how those who, you know, my husband was not a professor, we didn't have good income. And uh, so that is another time when, when a woman would, a scientist would give up because they just cannot afford. It was so expensive, like the childcare in the United States. But in Hungary, it was uh, when my daughter was four months old, it was, uh, we put in a, a daycare or ch childcare and it was uh, subsidized, heavily subsidized, but it was registered. Nurse were there every, every day a pediatrician came and I could leave a message there. They gave them the vaccines there. I didn't have to take day off to go to the doctors and I just signed that I agreed with it. And uh, so that, also, the government, if listening, can do something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, of course, you know, you still have to work very hard, but uh, this is the two places I could say that uh, mm -hmm. help is needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very important. Help with childcare, I can say from personal experience, it makes all the difference. Um, back to you, Jody. Uh, so, 2017, uh, Harvey Weinstein, uh, big story. Someone called it, uh, I think, uh, the most important news story of our generation. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, you know, we've, we've all read about it, we know so much about how the story unfolded, but maybe you can share with us, um, what are some of the things that you were surprised by or particularly interested in, in the process of, of doing this investigative uh, work? Sure, so I think one thing to say is that we had no idea what the impact of this investigation would be. In fact, I endured a lot of lectures from a lot of sources, including Hollywood executives, including female Hollywood executives, uh, you know, who said things like, Jody, you have to understand the casting couch is just part of this business. Hollywood consists of male producers and directors and an endless assembly line of gorgeous women who come to LA wanting to be actresses. And, you know, it's unfortunate that it happens, but it's kind of endemic to this business. It's been a part of it from the beginning. It's never gonna change. And personally, I don't think you're gonna get your story, but even if it's published, nobody is going to care because everybody knows that this is the way the world works. And so we encountered that again and again. And, you know, I find that often 
as a journalist, when someone is saying to you, you don't have a story, there's no story here, that reaction is in a way part of the story. Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to do in that moment in the interview is not be defensive and not argue with that person, but instead think, why does this person believe that? And what does that say about the context that I'm writing into? And also, how can I use that to make my story better? Um, so actually, there was a cab ride uh, that Megan and I shared uh, from Manhattan, from the New York Times offices back to Brooklyn where we live a few nights before the story was published. And, you know, we said to each other, do we really think anybody will care? We didn't know. <laughs> and as one of our editors um, pointed out very often, you know, probably just as in science, we have an internal skepticism about our stories because we're trying to stress test them and we're trying to make them better. So we come up with our own internal challenges to the stories. And one of our editors, Matt Purdy, he, before publication, he pointed out, he said, you know, Harvey Weinstein is not that famous, which <laughs> was true at the time. He's far more famous now. Um, <laughs> in terms of the behind the scenes process, I mean, I would say that one of the most surprising parts was the Israeli angle. Um, Ze sipur, mamash mesubach ve me'anyen l'saper po ba'aretz. But some of you may know that um, Harvey Weinstein deployed uh, a firm called Black Cube, which can, it's an Israeli firm. It consists of ex-Israeli uh, military in intelligence specialists. And um, they, they tried to foil our story, and they did so in a very unethical manner by trying to dupe us and dupe sources. It's very common in the kind of journalism I do for the person being covered to hire a private investigator. That can be a little dodgy, but it's basically considered within the boundaries of conventional practice. Like if somebody wants to hire a private investigator to whatever, read every story I've ever written or write, write a report on what my stories are like or say who I follow on social media, look, they have a right to do that. It's public information. It's out there, fine. What Black Cube did was very different. They tried to dupe me and to dupe some of Weinstein's alleged victims. So in the middle of the investigation, I start getting these kind of random sounding emails. And from, they're from this woman who calls herself Diana Phillip. And she says that she wants to meet with me. And she's kind of like dangling this proposition that's supposed to be attractive to me. She, she says she's from like a, a British financial firm. They want to do some conference on the future of feminism. They want me to speak. She had a website. It was a little weird looking. Um, and she kept asking to meet with me. And I kept blowing her off for two reasons. Um, one is that, and this shows actually that the black cube approach was not ultimately that sophisticated when it came to me. There are very strict New York Times ethics rules about who I can accept money from and who I can't. Mm -hmm. And I'm not allowed to take any kind of like big corporate speaking fees, which is sort of what she was hinting at, mm -hmm. you know, I might get if I, if I met with her. So she was, she was kind of dangling, you know, that sort of slight suggestion of money in order to get me to meet with her, but in fact, it made me cautious and it made me stay away because I was like, this is a waste of time. Like, I'm not taking this woman's money. And then the second thing is that I don't know if either of you um, as moms have had the position of using your kids to be able to get out of things that you don't want to do. But, you know, at the time of the Weinstein investigation, uh, my youngest daughter was a year and a half old. And um, for those of you who are parents, you probably remember what life was like in those days. And like, you know, my attitude was like, I don't have time for these random coffees. Like I'm trying to 
get, you know, Meg, Megan, by the way, had a baby. Megan um, had just finished maternity leave and had come back to the paper and straight into the Weinstein investigation. So my attitude was like, I am trying to get this story and then I'm trying to get home to my kids, you know, and zo, there is like no time for anything else. So I, I blew this woman off. I was like, look, at, like, I don't have time to see you. Um, but it turns out that her name was not Diana Phillip. She was an Israeli agent that was engaged by this firm to try to, f oh, and she posed as a women's rights advocate of all things, to, and she was trying to get information from me. And in fact, she did succeed in getting some information from Rose McGowan, one of Weinstein's alleged victims. So it's a troubling story. It's a story of really unethical conduct. And it's also just strange because here I am, like the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. I speak Hebrew. Uh, you know, I, like, you know, I've since wondered, like, did Black Cube, like, I know that they surveilled my apartment and whatnot. Like, did they take pictures of me, like, when we were having Shabbat dinner? Like, what, like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just so. Um, mm -hmm. completely bizarre. Yeah. But it's a whole other layer of the Weinstein story that a, you uh, it's a, happen to come across and, uh, and expose as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think that it's, I think the meaning at the end of the day is that even though they were manipulative and even though they charged a lot of money, they literally, there was literally a contract out on our story where Black Cube was gonna be paid mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of dollars to prevent our story from being published. Mm -hmm. But I think the lesson in the end is that they were no match for the truth and they were no match for the brave women who decided to come forward and help us and tell their stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I have a hard time seeing the clock, so I'm guessing we're beginning to run out of time, but uh, someone from the audience can... Four o'clock, okay, so we still have 15 minutes, which is great, because I wanted to leave some time for um, audience questions, but I, I will ask you just one more uh, quick question, uh, Jody, if I may. Um, I was intrigued by uh, something that you said, I can't remember what the context was, but I read it somewhere. You said that the first step for uh, social change often comes through the ability of good journalists to expose an ex a hidden truth. Um, and I'm just curious to know, kind of looking ahead, what would be uh, a project for today, right? Okay, we've exposed sexual harassment uh, in many, many fields, many areas, it's produced tremendous change. What is still hidden that we need to uh, look at in order to produce another step uh, in moving forward? Well, so, you know, my professional code prevents me from saying what, you know, me or my colleagues um, are covering next. But I think there's really so much. You know, I think there's so much we don't understand. And as you said, we can't solve a problem we can't see. And we really make a distinction between journalism and activism. Our feeling is that it's our job to extract the information, to verify that it's correct, to tell the story, and then the rest of the world has to decide what to do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, I'd like to turn to the audience if there are any questions, but even um, um, uh, for, as another option, uh, maybe one of you has a question to the other panelists. Uh, that's also a possibility, <laughs> if you'd like. I would actually like to say something to both of the other panelists. The first is that I agree with you that science and journalism are similar. One of my best friends from college, one of my peers, became a journalist. He was at the New York Times covering climate for a number of years, and I found that our, our thought processes were quite similar and analytical. That's the first thing. Second thing for you is that you're the one of the first people I've heard who said that having a child was actually an advantage in your career. <laughs> The other was Shirley Tillman, the very distinguished president of Princeton University, who talked about how that forced her to focus on what was really important and not let herself get distracted. Mm -hmm. so, so limits are also opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then to Katya, I want to say that, you know, it took me quite a while after I had been talking to Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan to think that 
to, to be able to say with a straight face that we thought it would be possible to cure, prevent, or manage all diseases by the end of the century. But what Kati has told you about is about preventing diseases through vaccines, about managing, about preventing infectious diseases through vaccines, about managing heart disease and liver disease. And I know things that, the, that you are working on in cancer as well. And I think when you see this sort of an example, the whole thing starts to seem strangely achievable. So thank you. Year and year. Yep. <laughs>
and we can think of them as well as the young women coming up. But in terms of being lucky, I do want to say one thing, which is another woman scientist who must be about 100 years old now, Brenda Milner, is a great neuroscientist who under, learned a, a lot about the, the nature of memory in the human brain, talked about how um, she was lucky. She said, yes, I was lucky, but I seized my luck with both hands. <laughs> Uh, I think we're almost out of time. Maybe a, a question or two from the audience uh, just to finish this. No time. Okay. Uh, well, in that case, uh, before I'll thank uh, the wonderful panelists that we heard today, I was asked to also remind everybody that there's uh, now uh, the inauguration of the Sylvan Adams uh, Sports Center that you're all invited to, and there are buses uh, outside ready to take you there, as well as to take you back to the Hilton at the end of the ceremony. So. Uh, please uh, join us uh, for that. Um, and uh, what I really want to say is how much I've enjoyed this conversation. You're all just wonderful and uh, interesting, and this is really a fascinating, fascinating uh, panel, and I thank you so much for your time. And th thank the audience as well for their participation. Yeah.